I will oh. say start. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone. Thank you for joining for today's session. I'm gonna present Random Forest. So, yeah. First thing that we need to ask ourselves is what is random? What is a random forest? Basically, what the book tells us is that a random forest is a modification of bug decision trees that build a large collection of decorrelated trees to improve the predictive performance. Basically, what this is saying is that, as we see in previous chapters, we do the bugging, we combine the bugging, the decision trees, we have come uh, multiple decision trees, and with the combination of that, we get a random forest. This is basically a machine learning algorithm used for classification and regression. And as I was just saying, it combines basically multiple decision trees to make predictions. And why, why will we prefer to use random forest instead of a decision tree or maybe something else? Yeah. The first thing that we need to remember is that as we have seen on the decision trees chapter is that decision trees have high variance. This is um, bad for our model because we cannot generalize after. It's like very specific to our training or training data. So in Instead of having that just one decision tree with high variance, we can use the random forest to well to get a better model. As I was saying, it is less sensitive to on our training data since it, it is randomized. It has like it can have like two or three random components. So it is highly randomized. Uh, and that helps us uh, to be like less less uh, specific specific for training data and more generalized to any data any future data that we can that we need to use. Another thing that the random forest has is that is its robustness as it reduces the impact of outliers and noise with the average. As we know, well, for decision trees, we take uh, an average value and that helps quite a bit. But with random forest, uh, we take the average of the average of, very, of several like decision trees. So this helps to reduce those impact of maybe a larger values or maybe a lot of uh, uninformative features. Uh, another thing that it is good for the random forest instead of the decision tree is that it has an increased accuracy as we will see on the next part. And it has a resistance to overfitting hyperparameters. What this means is that uh, we can overfit hyperparameters, but this random forest is like the, it's one of the algorithms that uh, suffers the, it's, it less suffers from hyperparameter tuning and all of that. So it has that kind of resistance. Okay, so first thing is uh, we're gonna extend bagging. We will do a random forest using the decision tricks and bagging as I was explaining be uh, before. And it has two con random components. The first random component is that is the bugging part. Since we are using bootstrap, we are selecting different observations in each like resample of our data. So that helps to get 
a more generalized model uh, that helps to reduce variance. And the other random component is that we are gonna assign like randomly, we can say, uh, different features to each decision tree. And that helps to get different decision trees that are not correlated. So if we had like, if we, if we use like the same features for every decision tree, we will get uh, different decision trees, but very similar ones, very correlated. So if we select randomly features, we will have different or very different decision trees that will help us reduce the, that correlation between trees. Uh, in here, we have like the main steps for the algorithm. The first step is to give a training data set. And we're going to select the number of trees to build. Later in the chapter, we will see how we can do that. Uh, in here, we start the iterative formula for the algorithm, the iterative part. So for, for every number of trees, from one to the number of trees, what we're going to do is we're going to generate a bootstrap sample of the original data. That's the first random component to minimize the variance of the model. Uh, we're going to grow our regression or classification tree to the, boost, uh, to the bootstrap data. And for each split, what we're going to do is we're going to select M try variables or features at random from all P features or variables. We're going to pick the best variable, the split point among the M try. We're going to split the node into two child nodes. This is basically the part of a decision tree. And we're going to end this part. Uh, we can use a uh, stopping crit criteria to determine for the tree model. And if the tree is complete, we do not, we do not prune it as we want the most complex, the most complex tree that we can get for now. Uh, one important thing that we have to mention is that the rule of thumb is that for regression, the number of variables that we can assign to the same tri variable is B, the, no, the total number of features over three. And for classification, uh, for M tri, we're gonna, we're gonna, we can select the square root of P. So out of the box performance, uh, the random forest, what the author says is that it's, he has good results without hyperparameter tuning. And as I was saying, it's one of the less variable models or algorithms that with the, with the changes of the hyperparameters. So it has less variability in the prediction accuracy when tuning among, among other algorithms. So in here, we're gonna create for the AMES dataset. We're gonna create a random forest, a default random forest without turning anything or without changing anything. The first thing that we need to do is that we're gonna select the number of features. In here, well, we just select the number of unique features of the cell pry of the AMES string of our training dataset. And with the ranger function, we're gonna write the formula here. We're gonna specify the training dataset. And we're gonna select the M try. As we are doing a regression, if this is a regression problem, we're gonna select uh, the number of features over three. And this one, this, mm, this parameter, respect that on order that factors equals order. What I understand is that for 
for variables that has levels, like categorical levels, it will order them. Um, it, that's what I understand that these parameters do. We're gonna select the seed for reproducibility, and we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna calculate. We run this model that will create the, our first random forest model, and we calculate the RMSC. We get twenty five thousand. $25,488 as, as our error. And just to mention that this, just with this default, default a random forest model without tuning anything, without changing anything, we get, uh, we get a very good error, kind of, almost better than the ones, almost everyone that we have seen before. Okay, so now for the hyperparameters, as we were saying, the, this model out of the box without tuning anything, without changing anything, just with the default, it gives us a good uh, performance. But there are things that we can change. There are things that we can tune in order to get better results. The main hyperparameters that we can tune are, first one is the number of trees, the number of trees that we will like uh, create or a random forest, uh, the number of features on each split. So as we can, as we said before, each split will have like a random number of features. So we can change that. The complexity on each tree, as we, these are the parameters that we can tune uh, for a decision tree, for, a, for just a decision tree. The sampling scheme, we will see more about that later. And the splitting rule during the tree construction, as well we will see later. Uh, the author says that number two have the largest impact on the predictive accuracy, the number of features on each split. Three and four are worth exploring the complexity on each tree and the sampling scheme. And five, the splitting rule during the tree construction have the smallest impact should, but, and this one, the fifth one should be tuned for computational efficiency since it's heavy computational. Okay, so the first one that we can change that we can tune is the number of threes. Uh, the author says it is not technically a hyperparameter. Uh, I'm not sure why it wouldn't count it wouldn't count as a as a hyperparameter to the model. It says that it needs to be large enough to stabilize, to stabilize the error, error rate. And a basic rule of thumb is that we can start with 10 times the number of features. So the second one that we can tune is the M try or the features for each split. So in, in this case, this one controls the split and it is the one that it gives us like the second random component of the random forest. That is the variable randomization. And the author says that for fewer predictors, a higher value of M try tends to perform better and the opposite as well. So for a high level of relevant predictors, uh, a smaller value of M try will tend to perform better. Now the tree complexity, this is the third one that we can change. Uh, as, we, as we saw in different chapters, in previous chapters, uh, for the decision tree, we can change the knot size, the max depth, the number of terminal knots. The author says this, those are the three main ones that we should focus uh, on, on random forest. 
the note size is the most common to tune. The default is one for classification and five for regression. That is like a rule of thumb that the author says. And if there are many noisy predictors, that is like a lot of variables, uh, a lot of uninformative variables and high M tri values or features for the split, random features for the split, uh, increasing node size tends to increase performance. So we have a lot of uninformative variables and high randomized variables. Uh, if we increase the node size, we will increase the performance of our random forest model. The next one that we can change is the sampling scheme. For this one, uh, the default is bootstrapping. That is the one that we almost uh, always use. And we can change the sample size. So maybe just to do things run a little bit faster, we can change the sample size. So in each bootstrap iteration, we can use like, instead of having a 100% sample size, we can change it to 20, to 50, to 60, to 80, as an example. And we can select with or without replacing replacement. Uh, decrease, decreasing the sample size leads to lower between tree correlation and sampling without replacement can help us with unbalanced categories and features with varying numbers of level varying number of levels this is because well if we have unbalanced categories uh, sampling without replacement will help us to uh, like to give it a higher chance to be selected to the uh, category to the less well to the rare uh, rarest category so we'll, it will give us like samples more more representative samples uh, next one the last one that we can change is the split rule so normally we use the split that minimizes the gene impurity for classification or the SSE for regression. This, this selection, this, this criteria favors features with many possible splits. And what the author says is that this method, the, con the conditional inference trees, it's an alternative that reduces this variable section selection bias, but it can be heavier to compute and it is not yet proven that it is more effective. So I'm not sure how good idea is to use that one instead of just using the default ones or the ones that we are used to. And another kind of alternative is the extremely randomized trees but the author says that it has no improvement or sometimes it can have negative impact on our model. So it is not recommended. Okay, so to now for the tuning strategies of our, of our hyperparameters, uh, the author says that as we have more complex algorithms, we have to start thinking of ways to do our tuning more efficiently. Uh, in this case, for example, we do a full Cartesian grid search. Uh, what a full Cartesian grid search, what it means is that in here we have all the values that we have for uh, the randomized features, for example, uh, the minimum node size, if we want it with replacement or without replacement, and the, uh, the fraction of the sample that we want for our model or for our bootstrapping, sorry. 
In this case, if we do a full Cartesian grid search, what we are where we are doing is that we are combining each and every one. We are trying each and every one of those combinations that we can achieve. If I'm not mistaken, these are like 240 combinations that uh, the program will need to check. So in here we have an example on how to do it. First, we create a hyperparameter grid with all the combinations that we want. Sorry. With all the combinations that we want for each parameter. Now we execute the full Cartesian grid search. So we're gonna do a four. And for each, uh, for each one, we're gonna say we're gonna do all the combinations. And we're gonna select them to uh, or to this to this random forest model. So we're gonna run that model 240 times. That is the number of combinations possible. We're gonna, and now we're gonna select the errors and we're gonna assess the top 10 models. So as we see here, with all these combinations that we got, the best one that we got, we have 26 variables for our randomization of features. The minimum node size it is one without replacement. And for the bootstrapping, we have an 80% of the sample. This will give us a 24,713 as our error. Uh, this is uh, smaller than the one that the one we found before with the default one. So this hyperparameter tuning, it actually helps the model. It actually gives us a better result. Now, in this case, it, it, the author says that, as we as I mentioned before, we add more hyperparameters and we manage more complex algorithms, this full Cartesian grid search becomes very computational expensive. So in here, we are gonna use the H2O package and it offers a random grid search that we need to give a stop parameter. A, a random grid search, basically what it does is that it will take random values from the grid search and according to the stop parameter, it will stop when, well, when it completes the parameter, with, when it completes the stop, the stopping condition. So we don't have to use, we don't have to check all the possible combinations. We just have to check a random ones and we, and we when complete that condition, we will stop. So the first thing that we need to do is that we need to initiate our, our H2O session and convert our datasets to H2O, H2O objects. Yeah, here we convert it. And here we set the response and the predictors variables. And now just as an example, we do our default random forest model using this function here h2o dot random forest and let's see what it gives us here we don't prune it or anything it just give us you just give us the default one and we get a default one of twenty five thousand. that's an error that is worse than the one we found with the hyperparameter tuning that we did before, but it is a little bit better of the default one that we got with Ranger for the first example. Now, in this case, we define our grid. Important thing is that it needs to be as a list. 
Oh, okay, in, in, in this example, we have 240 combinations. And we have here the parameters, all those possible combinations, our, all of our hyperparameters. And the thing, the stop condition, the important thing that we need to use right here is that if we have not experienced at least a 0.1% improvement in our error in the last 10 models, here we have it. We write 0 0.001. That's the percentage of improvement we want to see. And on, on our last 10 models, we specify them here. Or another stopping condition is that we stop after 300, 300 seconds. Here we have it, or five minutes. So we have these two stopping conditions. If each of, if any of those two conditions are met, the grid search will stop and we will get our model. Uh, we specify this, we assign this to the search criteria variable. And here we do the grid search. So basically what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use the h2o.grid function. We specify that we want a random forest model. We uh, save the ID as this ID, just to use it later for the results. Uh, we select that we will, this is the predictors, the response. Uh, the training frame needs to be uh, train our data set as an H2O object. And our hyperparameters is our hypergrid that we created before without the search criteria. The number of trees will be the number of features uh, times 10 that we already specified before. Our seed, the stop it metric will be the R RMSC. And here I have a doubt because on our search criteria, we specified that our stopping tolerance was like 0 0.001 and our stopping rounds uh, 10 as well. But I'm not sure this random grid function, if it will do here 0 0.005, or 0.5% or 0.1% that we specify inside here. I'm not sure the author uh, writes it as, as this. I don't know if any of you maybe knows the answer. Uh, uh, Mateo, uh, Ricardo here. I've worked uh, with H2O, H2O before. And what I believe is happening is that when you specify the some parameters in the in the H two O grid, uh, those parameters update the any other parameter that is in the list. Okay, so for example, the search criteria, uh, you specify the metric as a mean square error, the stopping rounds, the stopping tolerance. Well, because you are doing this in the grid already is going to update that with this information, okay? Uh, uh, you know, it's not the best practice, let's put it that way. It's not the best practice because if you have a search criteria, uh, what you should do is incorporate these parameters, the RMSE, room mean square error, the stopping routes and the stopping tolerance into the search criteria. And it will be, you know, it will be more uh, easy, easy, easy to to follow. But I believe what's happening is that he's updating uh, those parameters, and he's going to take it. The grid is going to take these parameters, and he's going to update it. You know, it, it's not going to get them from the search criteria. It's going to get them from this, you know, for this grid. Okay, it's it's like it's like an update uh, of parameters that he's doing. Oh, okay, so in this case, you yeah. will actually do 0.5%, right? As a exactly, yeah, because you are telling a specifically the grid to use this, okay? 
this uh, you know this metric. So what is going to do the grid is going to update, okay? Uh, but it's confusing. Uh, what I, what I would do if if I was doing this, what I would do in the search criteria already I'm using, I will use those parameters. I will use the RMSE. I will use the stopping tolerance 0 0.05, and then I don't have to specify them again. Okay. Okay. So uh, just specify them here. Right. Yeah. And yeah, because don't write you're, them you're, here. Exactly, because you are doing it already in the search criteria. So why do you want to then, you know, update that outside the search criteria? You know, just incorporate the search criteria and then you get rid of them. Okay. Okay. So what's the doubt? Yeah, but, but but usually the, the grid, those parameters takes precedence over anything that is, you know, inside the grid. As, as, inside as, the as Yeah, it's at the H2O grid. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's a little bit confusing <laughs> the way that the author, you know, did it because you know he's putting a search criteria first, and then he's you know uh, uh, replacing them in the edge to a grid. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> yes, it's, it's a little bit confusing, but oh yeah, yeah, because then you don't know. Okay, is is he going to go with the RMSE or the MSE? Is he going to stop the tolerance at point zero one or point zero zero five? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but now we know that it will take these values. Yeah, it, it, sh it should take th those values, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. perfect. So after that, uh, well, this is our random grid, as I was saying. Uh, it, it is not going to do the full, the full range of the grid. It will search randomly through the grid. And once we have these stopping conditions, if one of them are met, it will stop and give us our own model. Now we have the results with our model with the hypertuning, with the tuning of the hyperparameters. And one thing that I noticed here is that it still do the 240, the 40 uh, combinations, possible combinations. So it's doing all of them in the book. It is doing like only 190. I think this is because I have, maybe I have a different training data set. I think that I have a training data set different than the one in the book in this chapter. But with the one that I have and doing this hyper parameter tuning uh, with the random search, it, it does all the combinations, all the possible combinations. And it will give us, uh, it, here we have the MSC, oh, the, the best MSC, it will be this one. And if we turn it into the root square, we have a uh, root square, mean, root means square error of 24, thousand and nine hundred that is that is actually worse than the one we had here with just these parameters in this case we had twenty four thousand seven hundred so I'm not sure in in the author in the book it did give them it did give them a better result here with this random search random grid search but in this case I was having different results as I was saying maybe I have a different training data set but I'm not sure what I had but in this case I with this random grid search I did get a uh, worse I did get I did get a worse uh, error than the one uh, with we got before. And for the uh, last part. Mother, just a comment. Uh, my theory is, and I, I'm, I'm getting the same problem, you know, with uh, chapters that I'm that, that I'm doing. Okay, that I, I don't get the 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 same uh, metric and number uh, figure for, you know, for each of the other runs. I believe what's happening is that uh, this book was written in 2015, okay? So the R version 
that they're using, it's much older than the one that we're using. Usually we're using a four point, you know, XX uh, version, right? So what happens is that in version four, uh, for some strange reason, uh, the R consortium changed the algorithm for the, for the random uh, seed, okay? So for example, if you run a script, okay, with a random seed of let's say one, two, three, right? You run it on a version of R before uh, version four, it's going to give you a different result than if you run it with version four and so on, okay, with the same random seed. And that was a discussion, okay, especially in the academia, because they depend a lot on reproducible, you know, studies. And they, you know, uh, really uh, 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 were very annoyed that, you know, that they changed that algorithm. Apparently the change was because of efficiency, okay? You know, that they, they, they wanted to make it more efficient, the, the, the process of generating those random numbers. But the consequence is that the random seed, even if this is the same, it's not going to give you the same random sequence of numbers when you use uh, R version, you know, before R R4 and R4 and so on. Okay, so I believe that that's what is happening here. Okay, because in every instance that I have run the algorithms, you know, specify in the book, and I use the same random seed, I get different results. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. So and, that 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 could that could explain, and that's something that you know in the future uh, we must be aware. Okay, that if you want to replicate uh, at, at least in the random you know uh, sequence of numbers, if you want to replicate that you know uh, uh, that that uh, study, uh, you have to use the same version that the author uh, used. Okay, that's why usually. In you know, especially in the, in, in the academia uh, uh, sphere, what you do is that you uh, you do a system info, okay, a system info, and you give all the parameters and all the version of the packages that you use, okay. So you should reproduce this with this environment, okay, with this R version and with this R you know packages version, because also the packages changes too, okay. So. Right. Uh, that, that's how you can reproduce this. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, I have I have uh, uh, versions in my computer, you know, uh, uh, before four. Uh, maybe in the week I can do an experiment to see if changing the version of, of R to less than version four, if that gives me the same results as the book is, is done. If if it does that, then that's the explanation. Okay, it's not that you know you're using a different set or anything like that. It's just that the random uh, generator is different. Okay, even if you are using the same seed. Okay. Okay, yeah, you understand. And maybe, yeah. do you uh, have like any source that we can check? Maybe what kind of method are they using to the random forest or the decision uh, tree? You have uh, I, I, uh, the R consortium is the one that you know, has all the, you know, all, all the all the authority, you know, to do, you know, to to uh, validate R. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I know that there were some articles, okay? Some articles uh, worried, worried that, that, you know, is going, is going to create a problem in terms of the adoption of new versions of R. So uh, you have to look for articles when, you know, it changed from three to four. And that, that change in that random generator uh, algorithm, okay? Uh, right now, you know, it's not something that, you know, uh, you know, people are talking about because we already passed that, okay? Uh, a lot of people are working in version four. And, you know, if we work in version four, uh, you know, uh, 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 in, the, in the, the future, uh, you shouldn't have that problem. But it's when you do that crossover, between version three and version four, okay? And because this book has not been updated to version four, I bet you, because it's, it's still in, in version three, then you'll have those, uh, probably you have those differences, okay? Okay, you got it. Yeah, got so, it. So, so it's something that you have to be aware if you are, you know, getting a study that it was done 
before version four. Okay, if 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 if, if it's one year, two years from from now, uh, you shouldn't have any problem because you know version four was released about two years ago. Okay, got it noted. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's but yeah, that, that that was a big a big uh, you know a, 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 a big discussion <laughs> there in terms of you know why do you change that. You know, you didn't consider, you know, what, what was the, the consequences? And they say, well, you know, we consider it, but we think that in the long run, you know, this is going to be a better, a, be, a better version. Okay, so I guess that was their answer, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, de deal with it. <laughs> yeah, 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 I will. But then, I will but then you know, the books that. that are not updated, for example, if you update the book, that's fine, you know, because then, you know, you're going to have the, 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 the new version. But if you don't date those books, then you're going to have this uh, this uh, discrepancies. Okay, but I, I, for but for peace of mind, I'll, I'll try to do this way. I'll try to do an experiment using an R version before four, and see what happens. Okay. Okay, <laughs> I will try to do it as well, and I will try to like do some yeah. research on what methods are they using. You know, right. I'm also interested in knowing maybe what Python will give us yeah that would be interesting too yeah i mean python has its own its own version of incompatibilities you know also so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean but that yeah. in, in, in python is worse okay i mean that that's one of the for me that's one of the weakness in the python you know environment that they don't have a cram okay they you know if if, if you do a package in python let's say you do it in 3.8 whatever okay uh there's no mechanism in the python environment no mechanism to try to see which are the version of let's say pandas numpy or mathplotlib is compatible with okay you just say okay I, I i did the test and this is compatible with this okay but you have to do it yourself you cannot depend on an external source like r that uses cram okay is it, it, the cram package yeah, does that for you okay it checks the Incompatibility, and then you know it, it gives you the error. You know this fail, all right. But in Python, you don't have that. <laughs> so yeah, it, it gets it gets crazy there. <laughs> well, I'm still yeah. like starting to learn Python, but yes, <laughs> right. I mean, uh, the, the 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 challenge in Python is making your environment with the packages compatible. That's the basic you know rule here. Once you get that package, you know, that environment set, you know, you, you're good, okay? Because you know that everything is going to work as expected. But getting there, hmm, in, uh, bad, you know? Yeah, if, if, you, if you use a H2O package, uh, you have to really watch the version, okay? Because a couple of packages that use, you know, that, that depend, H2O depends on it, uh, you have to know, know the versions of it. You know, for example, pandas, numpy, mathplotlib, which are the you know the core of, 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 of the Python you know data science uh, environment. Uh, you have to really be be very aware of that. Okay, and sometimes, for example, Conda, sometimes Conda you know tries to help you. Okay, in other words, okay, if you use this version, we're going to guarantee that the package that you're going to use you know is compatible with all the dependencies. Okay, so Conda is doing something like RAM. All right, but if you go pip, for example, <laughs> okay, you go pip, ah, you're not your or your own. You know? <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't give you those checks. All right, okay. Believe me, I I I have headaches, you know, and especially <laughs> when you are, for example, in R. Uh, usually, when I start R Studio, the first thing that I do is you know update the packages, right? Okay, yeah. that's one of the first things that I do, you know, to get you know everything you know up to date. And in Python, you cannot do that, okay? Because if you update one package, uh, probably there will be incompatibilities with the packages that are already there, okay? So probably you have to create a new environment. Uh, it's, uh, I've tried it and it doesn't work, okay? It messes up, you know, it destroys my, my, my environment. <laughs> so yeah, Python is uh, it's a pickle in, in, that, in that sense. Once you got the environment set up, hey, you know, uh, you know, uh, go 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 with it, okay. <laughs> but getting there is the is the big thing. Is the big you know problem here. <laughs> yes, but from what I've seen, 
R is definitely a lot easier than Python. Oh yeah. Yeah, in, in terms of that, in terms of the package compatibility, you know, R is much easier. You know, uh, you don't have to worry about that really. Okay, because CRAN already, you know, uh, uh, does it for you. You know, the, the, there's, a, there's a framework that does it for you, but that's not available in Python. The, the only thing that I have seen that is kind of similar to CRAN in R is a Conda. Okay. Okay. And Conda is, uh, you know, it's, it's an organization, it's a private company. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, uh, Anaconda is a kind of open source kind of a Python kind of a IDE, like an integrated yeah, development environment. So, yeah, they yeah. actually, the way the way they updating the Python packages is a kind of like a, they, when they updating one packages, they actually updating the relevant packages relate directly associated with that package updates. So, uh, literally, when if you use the Anaconda, maybe in the Python environment, mm -hmm. maybe you don't have to worry about that one too. But the thing is, if you can use the Python just kind of as a as a separate kind of language, like a, as it is, like mm -hmm. when you're downloading the Python website and then just directly downloading the that Python uh, program and then you just uh, install the packages separately, yeah. Like uh, as uh, Ricardo mentioned, there might be the incompatibility mm -hmm. problem. But the thing is, uh, under the Anaconda environment, when you updating one one Python packages, Anaconda automatically updating the its yeah. relevant packages. So actually, mm -hmm. that means right. maybe uh, as with R, you if you use the maybe Anaconda notebook or Spider. In, in to use the Python, you don't have to worry about the package updates. So, so but but the real problem is that they actually a little bit lag behind about the updating the Python version because uh, right now right. it's the Python three point eleven or twelve or something. But yeah, they still stay twelve, and they're still yeah. they're still doing three point eight. <laughs> yeah, they still yeah they still I think they they recently updating about the three point ten, but. They okay. still lag behind the kind of a Python, oh, yeah. recent latest the Python kind of a programming. So, so that's the kind of thing. And, and also as for the, the set seed kind of a function, like a random, mm -hmm. uh, like a random fixed pattern function. I, I think that maybe Matteo, you actually closed the R Studio and then you reopened the R Studio and then rerun the same code with the same set seed pattern, you cannot get the that RMSC value. Mm -hmm. You know why? Right. That is that is because of the, the it's the random forest has the sampling sampling method for the random forest is a bootstrapping, right? Every bootstrapping has a highly randomized kind of a resampling technique. So every time you run the model, you get a different result. But the thing is. You, you just set the seed and then run the model. Just, just for, uh, just while, just keep opening the dead file. You still get the same result. But the thing is, uh, when you close the R Studio and then uh, you reopen, rerun the R Studio and then uh, rerun the code from the beginning to the end like this, your RMS is gonna be different, cause. Uh, the, the reason why it, it happened like that is whenever you close uh, close the R Studio, that random setting pattern gonna be removed, deleted. And then when you reopen the R Studio and then uh, rerun the this model with the same set seed random pattern, you R Studio gets some another random kind of a pattern of the fixed pattern of the random pattern, randomized trials. That actually changing the result. Okay, but that's not like uh, if we set a seed. Uh, yeah, that is not like the idea of setting a seed that I can close our studio, close everything, and run yeah. it again and get the same result. Oh really? 
Because uh, in my case, well, that was what I was. That's what I think. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, but you, can, you, can, you can do the experiment. You can do the experiment. I know. Yeah. Because I mean, uh, no yeah, just a, yeah, stuff. just a try. Because uh, based on what I experience about the these kind of sassy kind of functions, when I close the R Studio and then when I close the that R code and then rerun the R code, every time that code is a uh, rerun after the closing and relaunching the R Studio, that RMSC produce uh, give us a kind of a different value. That's what I experienced, but I'm not sure because uh, I I just kind of remember because it it's a kind of a quite long time ago. So, but right now it's might be the updated or something. So maybe I think that I want you to experimenting those things and then uh, maybe. If you get the same result, that might be much better. But based on my experience, whenever you close the R Studio and then uh, open the R Studio again and then rerun the this code, even if you have the same set seed, uh, like, like a one, two, three kind of a set, same set seed for the fixed random pattern, then RMSC is going to be different because of the random. Every time that random four is going to be produced, the sampling method is going to be different. Hmm. So no, that's sure. what I thought. But the thing is, you just experiment, and then maybe I would be glad mm -hmm. to see if there is any changes or is the, the, the RMS is the same or something. If you can let us know about your experimental result, that might be awesome. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we'll experiment later today yeah. <laughs> and I will let you yeah. know through Slack, see what yeah. I got. Yeah, because uh, my, my guess is that even if we can set up the fixed uh, random uh, pattern number, like a set seed, set seed and one, two, three or something, with even if the same, same pattern number, maybe whenever you rerun the code, after closing and reopening the R code and then uh, just rerun the code from the scratch, my guess is the still that might be the a little bit that might be the different, but that's actually what I what I understand when I learn the code. I also had to learn this kind of code before, especially for the propensity score matching method. Also have a, this this kind of issues. So at that time when I actually set the seed, I did not have the same result. But but it depends. Yeah, just just experimenting that and then. Uh, if you can, if you can get the, this, this number, just let us know. That might be much, that might be awesome. Okay, uh, one, one recommendation. recommendation. Uh, if you're going to yeah. do the experiment, try to do it with the Ranger model, you know, that you discussed first, because the H2O, uh, if, if you run this again, this hyperparameter again, it's not guaranteed that you're going to get the same model, okay? Okay, so uh, okay. You, know, you could get the same models, but not necessarily, and that's something mm -hmm. that is documented in, in H2O. Okay, because it's, it's the way internally that they get the, these models. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do the experiment, I will try to do it with the with the Ranger, you know, with the base uh, algorithm, Ranger or Random Forest. Okay, but you're using Ranger because of the book. So uh, use the ranger because ranger is it should give you the same, the same, uh, the same result. Okay, H two O. It depends on the models that you're going to be, uh, you know, producing, and the models mm. could change. Okay, yeah, they, they could it just <laughs> yeah, just to please to rerun the this code again after the from the scratch and then just see what I what we got and then. Maybe I personally guess is the RMS is gonna be a little bit different, but it's still pretty close to each other. But the thing is, whenever we rerun the code from the scratch, that RMS is gonna be slightly different, I guess, depending on the the way resampling the uh, resampling the things like a begging. So. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it is actually happened to me when I rerun the propensity score matching analysis because that one also has a kind of a random trial 
resampling technique. But yeah, yeah, just to try. I, I, then, I, I will use yeah. the, the 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 random forest algorithm, the range, not not the H yeah. two O. Okay, because the H two O, the you know they say that you know every time you run the, you know the the training, okay, for their models, uh, the models you know doesn't necessarily have to be the same. Okay, the same the same models don't have to be the same result. All right. Okay. Uh, but if you do the ranger or the random forest, uh, you know, you should have at least the same algorithm uh, to play with. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we'll try them both to see what happens yeah. because yeah. it's yeah. interesting to see what happens. Yeah. I will let you know. Yeah. So okay. Good. Just to finish this real quick. <laughs> mm -hmm. The last part was feature interpretation. So in here, the author tells us that there, there are two methods. We can use mm -hmm. the impurity based measure mm -hmm. that we used before. It is measured on the average total reduction of the loss function for mm -hmm. each feature. Or we can use for random forest, we can use a permutation based measure for each tree. The out of box sample is passed down the tree and the prediction accuracy is recorded. Mm -hmm. After that, the values for each variable are randomly permitted and we compute the accuracy again. And the decrease in accuracy is averaged over all trees. And the variables with the largest decrease are considered most important. That's how we can measure the feature interpretation in here. I, the, okay, we have the book here. And we should get this. As the author said, it is different. It can be different, but it is almost almost the same, but mm. it is different. Yeah. And that will be all for this chapter. I don't know if maybe anyone has any other question. Hold on, let's see. So...